Hello the world, uh, hello internet, hello Jason Isaacs. Um, let's talk about presidential power. Okay, now, this is going to be a fairly dry presentation uh, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, not least, there's a lot to get through. Um, and also because a lot of the detail is fleshed out in other presentations. Uh, in terms of presidential legislative uh, role, that's explained in great detail in the uh, presentation on Obamacare. And uh, I have a separate policy, I have a separate, a separate presentation on foreign policy as well. So I'm going to try to avoid getting drawn into the weeds too much uh, in this particular presentation. But that means we're, what we're going to do is we're going to range far and wide over all of the president's powers and the checks on that powers. And with that in mind, we should probably start uh, dividing it up. And the first division I'm going to make is between his, uh, his hard and soft powers and specific and general checks and balances. And this relates to uh, what's in the Constitution and what is implicit or inferred uh, from the Constitution. In terms of hard powers, this is basically what's in the Constitution. So it says the president can do this, so therefore the president can do that. Uh, while this is obviously very effective and very useful, it's going to be subject to a constitutional check. And so um, there are obviously swings and roundabouts um, working here. Uh, soft power, it's the other way around. This is not uh, explicitly listed in the Constitution, uh, but it may arise as a consequence of other aspects of the role. And uh, because it's not explicitly listed in the Constitution, then it's not going to be subject to a direct check. But there will be other limitations on it and other sort of implicit checks uh, that we can find when we uh, dig into the actual things in practice. Uh, so flip side of that is that there are specific checks. These are detailed in the Constitution and there are general checks uh, that work on limiting presidential power through uh, other uh, mechanisms and constitutional context. Now then, again, I'm going to try to avoid getting into the weeds in any of this stuff because that's all explained elsewhere and we've got a lot to cover. But starting with our hard domestic powers, let's look at the executive. So the president has control of the executive branch uh, through executive orders and through patronage. Now, both of these I explained in another presentation, so I'm not going to get dug into that. Uh, but you need to know that while these are effective, both have profound limitations. And um, that's all I'm going to say on the matter right now. And I'm going to direct you towards other presentations where I go into all of this in much more detail. Similarly, in terms of the legislative process, we know that the president bookends the legislative process. He gets involved at the beginning and at the end. Um, again, not going to go into those in much detail other to say that the veto is often used as a power. Um, but um, it always strikes me as more of a an indication of weakness. If the president is having to reach for the veto, then it suggests that the um, it suggests that uh, the working relationship between congresses has basically broken down, uh, or at least the communication uh, between him and Congress has broken down. And so, um, yeah, uh, yes, yes, it is a power. OK, but it is indicative that something is going uh, pretty wrong. Judiciary, very, very simple. Nominate candidates for senior judicial positions, especially but not only SCOTUS. Now, don't forget that the president gets to appoint judges across the entire uh, federal system. And uh, Trump has been able to appoint a vast number of conservative judges for all sorts of reasons. We don't really bear uh, going into in great detail. But the point is that the uh, if the next cab on the rank uh, is where you go to for your uh, Supreme Court vacancies, then when you've got conservative after conservative after conservative, uh, it gets difficult. Uh, for future democratic presidents to uh, make appointments that are going to shift in any significant way the balance on the Supreme Court. Remember, the balance on the Supreme Court is currently 5-4. Now, back in the old days, back in the pre-2018 revi revisions, all of these were basically 15 markers. Uh, you don't need to know them, uh, perhaps to the same uh, degree of detail, but as they are critical um, executive uh, powers, then uh, you definitely need to know what they mean, uh, why they sometimes work and perhaps why they sometimes backfire. But you're not going to have to do a deep dive uh, the way that your predecessors used to uh, in each of these. So um, that's either a good or bad thing, depending on where you're coming from. Similarly, in the soft uh, power, uh, the bully pulpit. Well, pre-Trump, this was always quite hard to quantify. But um, the point of the bully pulpit is when the president speaks, uh, people have to listen. And uh, that happens in a way that other politicians just don't get to enjoy. So whether it's Twitter or Fox or even not just Fox, uh, Trump commands the uh, the oxygen of publicity in a way that nobody else really has been able to do so um, ever. 
So whether he's haranguing his enemies or rallying his base, uh, when Trump speaks for good or ill, uh, people tend to listen and he can get his point across. <laughs> um, sometimes quite effectively, sometimes uh, less so. Uh, power to persuade. Again, I don't want to go into this in too much detail because I will basically derail this entire legislation, this entire presentation. But here it's useful to contrast it with the UK. When the Prime Minister turns around to Congress and says, give me legislation, uh, Parliament goes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and we only rush it through. The Prime Minister says, jump. Parliament says, how high? It's very, very different in the United States. If the President says, jump to Congress, Congress turns around and very, very simply says, well, what's in it for me? Well, sometimes there's something in it for them. Sometimes it's less obvious what's in it for them. And so it's less obvious why, why, why Congress should comply. So the Prime Minister has Which that I complicit... Know. Um, legit has that compliant majority. Um, Trump or any American prime minister does not have a compliant majority. Uh, he might not have a majority. It probably won't be compliant. And so all he can try to do is to persuade the legislature. And uh, we see that certainly in um, when he's working in the Obamacare presentation. So go and look at the Obama presentation. And that's all I have to say on the matter uh, at this point. Foreign powers, perhaps uh, much more straightforward. He is commander in chief of the military. When he says go, the military goes. Uh, similarly, he is the chief negotiator, uh, either in his own capacity or indeed uh, through his proxies. This is all laid out in the Constitution. The president is the military chief and he uh, goes out and um, works with the neighbors. So whether it's fighting or talking, the president is the uh, first line uh, of action. Looking at foreign soft powers, then perhaps the threat of military action. I mean, no one else spends more on the Americans. Um, so um, threatening a, a goodwill visit by the Seventh Fleet uh, may be sufficient to persuade somebody to change their position. Or maybe not. Um, diplomacy, use of executive agreements in lieu of formal treaties. Again, this used to be a 15 marker. Um, it has strengths and weaknesses, and I explore those in the presentation on foreign policy. And so again, Tempting as it is to get drawn into this at this point, let's not do it. The only thing I would say is that uh, executive agreements are easier to put in place uh, because they don't require the ratification of the Senate. Uh, but the quid pro quo for that is that they are not binding. The executive agreement is reckoned to be between the executive himself. So it's between the president who negotiates it and the foreign power with whom he negotiates it. Once that president leaves, the uh, next president may or may not choose to um, to uh, to recognize or to reinstate that executive order, which is kind of, I think, what we saw with the Paris Accord. Uh, the Paris Accord was never ratified by the Senate. In fact, when Obama negotiated it, he negotiated it as an executive agreement because he knew the Senate would never ratify it. And so Trump has quite simply come in and said, no, we're not going to bother with that. And um, so it has essentially expired. Uh, right. Finally, uh, the use of Twitter and other technological innovations. Again, we're looking here primarily at something that is very, very Trumpian uh, in its nature um, and not very much you can do about a president who's tweeting away at three o'clock in the morning uh, other than take his phone away. And seeing as I struggle to get the phone away from my 12 year old daughter, I'm not really sure how you're going to get it away from the president of the free world. Um, domestic specific checks. Well, legislature. Uh, the legislature can impeach Trump. We know about that. It's uh, currently can impeach sorry the president, and uh, it's currently deciding whether or not it's going to impeach Trump. Uh, they can also overturn the veto. That requires two thirds of both houses, um, and uh, all of the data on that is uh, contained uh, on uh, is contained on uh, on Wikipedia or anywhere else you choose to go. Of course, uh, and you can over overturn the veto if the veto is deployed and you can only veto legislation that's been passed. So if legislation isn't being passed, then the veto isn't being used and you don't have to overturn it. So the veto has become increasingly less relevant uh, in recent years. However, do have a look at George W. Bush's veto record, uh, the numbers that he did, uh, the times he did them and the frequency with which they were overturned. That is a very, very interesting little statistic there. Uh, advice and consent. This is the way in which the Senate has to ratify uh, either some appointments or indeed uh, treaties, uh, although that's foreign, of course. And uh, domestic checks on the judiciary. Well, uh, the 
the uh, the president is subject to the rule of law and so uh, has to answer uh, for that. The president has to act in a way consistent with the law. Now, we all know about uh, the question whether or not the president is immune from arrest while he's in office. Could he kill somebody uh, on the uh, floor of the Oval Office and not uh, be, uh, be arrested? Uh, the short answer is we don't know. Um, no president, as far as we're aware, has killed anybody in the Oval Office. And uh, were he to do so, things would get very, very interesting. Trump seems determined to push this particular thing to its limits. Uh, but uh, we don't quite know where that one's going to finish uh, as yet. And uh, I'll push off on that link and uh, show you where that takes us. Domestic general checks. Well, the Congress uh, controls the legislative process. So if the president wants law, Congress may or may not give it to him. It's entirely up to them. But perhaps more importantly, the Congress has the power of the purse. The president has no independent income. The president can only spend uh, the money that Congress allocates to uh, the president. And a very, very good example of that is the wall. The president can't build the wall without congressional money. The president is also subject to committee oversight. Uh, and so Congress can uh, investigate the president as uh, as 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 happens frequently. And uh, obviously the number of ongoing investigations into Trump, just as there were ongoing investigations into Obama and some of Obama's action and indeed uh, those of George W. Bush. Domestic general, then we have the concept of judicial review. Um, judicial review, remember, not actually in the Constitution. And so uh, that's why it's in a general check. Uh, rather than a specific check. In terms of foreign specific powers, well, the military, only Congress can declare war, and that's about it. Uh, we also have the, well, we have the War Powers Resolution, but that's not in the Constitution. In terms of diplomatic, then Senate is there for advice and consent, that is the ratification of treaties and uh, appointments to the diplomatic corps. Um, yeah, let's, let's put in the War Powers Resolution, it should probably be there. War Powers resolution and that was 1973 not in the constitution uh, but now definitely uh, a formal check on the president uh, or do i put it in here sanction for military action this is the new one no one declares war anymore and so the president uh, requires uh, sometimes sorry requires the consent of congress in order to act uh, in terms of diplomatic trade and aid this is much more interesting in that um, Trade and aid should be controlled by Congress, uh, but these various acts have allowed Cong have allowed the president much greater leeway to operate in uh, in foreign uh, matters than the Constitution perhaps necessarily ex expected. Again, I go into that in much more detail on my presentation on foreign power, on foreign policy, so I'm not going to get dragged into the weeds uh, right now. So, yes, now we are just about done. And uh, what I'm going to suggest is that I link off to various other presentations, not least the Obamacare and the present foreign policy. And otherwise, we are done. So um, let's get this one up on um, the Internet and um, I'll see you in my next presentations. Thank you very much. See you soon.